Hey, Charles. Hey everybody, hope everybody's doing well today. Good to see y'all. Um, go ahead and get going here. I think I've got a couple more people, but we'll get started. So uh, a couple changes just recently. Um, Jude's not gonna play today. Um, he was uh, he was in a, like a car pileup accident. It wasn't his fault, but he's dealing with that <laughs> rather than performing. So. Um, I'm going to kind of do a couple of things that I thought maybe I would do uh, later here and I'll do them now and then we'll have some time for, for more playing uh, yet later in, uh, in July. So I'll be talking to people about those opportunities. And then I kind of mentioned this to a few of you and might have mentioned it briefly last week, but the last week of lessons, uh, which is July calendar, drum roll please. Uh, is July 21st, 22nd, 23rd. On that Wednesday, July 22nd, I think what we'll do is we'll do like a very abbreviated uh, Zoom studio recital. And so everybody will have an opportunity to play. We won't give comments. We'll just, we'll just perform for each other. And the link that I send out for that week, um, I'll probably use the same link, but I'll open it up so that people who are not in my contacts can use that link and join the uh the meeting so that they can watch you play so if you want to uh do you know for your performance if you want your parents to watch your friends and family that sort of thing um you're more than welcome to share that link so i'll be sending out more information about that as we get to it um let's see if i can get this other microphone to work if i do that can everybody hear me still we're good okay cool so um Today, I'm going to basically hit two big topics. The first topic I want to talk about is the diagnostic tool of the cutaway mouthpiece. And I've chatted about this some, but I wanted to actually show everybody some of this because I think of quite a few of you now have, uh, have one of these. So I want to kind of show you how this actually works and how to use it. Um, and I've been going over this with a few of you individually, but it's sometimes useful to kind of see what my overall comments are on the and then uh, I do want to spend just a little bit of time uh, going over some of the COVID-19 recommendations when it comes to trombone. Uh, things aren't nearly as bleak as we once thought um, in terms of actually playing chamber music and, and lessons in person and stuff. So there's a few things that are coming down that I just wanted to kind of keep everybody um, apprised of. So uh, 
just to start off with the cutaway mouthpiece. Um, these, these little guys, if you haven't used one yet, or if I haven't talked to you about yet, this is essentially just a mouthpiece that has a big chunk of the cut, uh, the cup cut away. And I've been using these since about 2000, 2001 maybe. Uh, and it used to be that you just had to go out and buy uh, a mouthpiece, like a Bach six and a half AL or something like that, or find a used mouthpiece, get a grinder and grind your mouthpiece away. And I almost lost a big chunk of my index finger to grinding out one of these ones. But it's pretty handy now. Uh, uh, my former teacher now makes these and they're machined in a shop in Iowa and they're, they're pretty clean. There's a lot few, a lot fewer sharp edges to cut oneself on and you don't have to buy a grinder, which is pretty pleasant. So um, these, these tools can be used a variety of different ways, but I think the biggest thing that they can help with is developing your embouchure and your accuracy. So if we're talking about range accuracy or if we're talking about uh, lip slur accuracy, these are really useful. Um, so it's essentially an extra step to buzzing on your mouthpiece. So when we buzz on the mouthpiece, we still have just a little bit of back pressure, less back pressure than we have when we're playing on the instrument, but just a little bit of back pressure. And if you eliminate some of that back pressure, what you're gonna notice is that your embouchure and your corners have to be really set. And then the air is what drives all of your pitch differences. Now I can't say that this is a great sound, <laughs> um, but it's, it's gonna end up being kind of an airy or open sound that you're gonna get um, when you're, when you're uh, buzzing on the, the uh, cutaway mouthpiece like this. And this uh, will help, like I said, with your uh, embouchure and developing the strength. It also forces you to use a wind-based buzz. And I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna try to show you what this is really like. So if I'm buzzing just with my muscles, I can get an okay sounding buzz on the mouthpiece. It sounds a little wavery. You can get very good at this. But when you move over to the cutaway mouthpiece, all of that disappears if I try to do it. Because I don't have any back pressure from the, from the actual mouthpiece. So that's one thing that really helps. It also helps you smooth out some of your slurs. So if you're working on lip slurs, that little hitch where you feel like the mouthpiece or the trombone is grabbing a note. And then as you go down, it's grabbing the note and you feel like you're kind of being forced into one partial or the other, that gets completely eliminated by the cutaway. It's a lot like free buzzing, except we lose all the other issues that come along with free buzzing. So you can really strengthen your, your lip slurs that way as well. So there's, there's a bunch of different things that are useful ways of practicing with the cutaway. The other reason I like the cutaway is uh, because, and I feel like I sound a little bit like an infomercial and that's because I am, but <laughs> the other reason I really like this is you can actually identify a lot of issues with playing when you use the cutaway. And that's because we can actually see what's happening with a lot more of the embouchure. So one of the cool things that you'll notice is you can actually see if your embouchure is centered or not. And what I mean by centered is, is the top lip centered on the bottom lip. And what you're gonna notice is that mine is not. So it doesn't 100% matter, but sometimes we can really see if someone has a disjunct uh, embouchure. And sometimes this helps with those of us, uh, there, there are some students who actually play with their jaw disjunct. So almost like that, not that extreme, but almost like that in order to get up in the higher range or down in the lower range. And this can actually help us identify that and try to eliminate that just a little bit so that we're not dealing with um, the split in the aperture. So if we watch me do this, and this is a little tricky with the camera, so I'll try, um, but you'll actually see that my top lip is not 100% centered on my lower lip. Something like that. So I actually have more upper lip over here on my left side. That's not a huge deal, but 
it helps me identify some of the issues with my range. That for me mostly hurts me when I'm going down in register and I need that lip to be a little bit more centered in the mouthpiece. So that's something that's really useful for me to be aware of. The other thing that's really gonna help with that is it's gonna tell me what's going on with my teeth, either my front teeth and if they're down too far and maybe clenched or if my jaw is clenched while I'm playing. And that happens sometimes too, where we're blowing air out, but our jaw is really close together. And that gives us kind of that airy sound. So I'll just kind of show you what some of this sounds like as an example. So this is me playing with my front teeth too close together. <laughs> notice a couple of things that are pretty big highlighters this is what's going on every time I articulate the wind actually stops that's because there's so much force coming from the tongue that there's no place for that air to go it just becomes static and the second thing that you're going to notice is you're going to get kind of that burry sound that sound sometimes that comes from something else so it's possible that that's a multiple point issue but often that means that um, the air is being stopped by the front teeth. So if we put that on the mouthpiece, we actually don't have as many problems. We can tell that it's not a very free buzz, but we don't have as many problems as we did on the horn. But if we take the cut away, it all becomes very clear very quickly because there's absolutely no back pressure. <laughs> I'm having to use so much air to get my lips to vibrate with my teeth clamped down together like that, that I actually can't get through a whole note playing that way. So that's just another way in which this is really useful at identifying some issues with the teeth. Same thing's kind of true of the jaw. It's a, it's a little bit different, but we end up with a sound kind of like this. It's a particularly noticeable down in the lower register. As we go up in register, we often do have to bring the jaw a little bit closer together to direct the air. But I can put it on the cutaway and I'll really notice it quick. It's really, really tight sounding and not flexible. So you can actually practice with the cutaway to help out with some of those issues. So one of the things that I really like to do with a cutaway is actually put it in the mouthpiece receiver so that I'm doing kind of all my normal practicing with the horn because the horn dictates so much of our, our approach of the instrument to our embouchure and our body's approach with all of this. So it's, that's really nice function. And if I'm dealing with my teeth being too close together in the front or even in the jaw, what I would start with is just seeing if I can get air to go past my lips while playing on the cutaway. So something kind of like this. If I can get that nice wind sound, that's really good. Sometimes I kind of relate this akin to blowing out a candle. You don't want to blow the candle super forcefully or because either the flame won't go out or you're going to blow wax everywhere. Now, maybe this isn't a great example because not many people use candles anymore, but something to think about. So you can just try to get wind to go past your lips at first with the cutaway. And then what you find is if you start to direct your aperture without moving your teeth too much, you can actually start to get a buzz. And then what you can do is actually start with your aperture starting closed do an air attack on the cutaway mouthpiece and figure out where that perfect place of resistance, that point of resistance in the aperture really is for you. Now I can show you just a little bit better probably in the camera maybe what's really happening here. You'll see that my aperture starts closed and then the wind is blowing it open, hopefully.
It's a little tricky to show on camera, but the idea being here that I'm finding exactly what the wind is going to blow uh, open for different pitches. If this is something that you're working on, some of you are working on this right now, it takes some time to actually figure out what's going on with the aperture. Um, so this is this is kind of a multi-step process if you're dealing with some front teeth or some some jaw issues. So that's a really nice way of identifying some some problems in different playing. Um, the great thing about this is you can add all of your practice techniques that you usually just use on the mouthpiece onto the cutaway and again apply it to the instrument. So um, I, I love to do my regular lip slur exercises or even Brad Edwards uh, lip slur melodies on these. You can do your um, Roshu exercises or Conconi exercises, uh, etudes, by playing them on the horn and then playing them on the cutaway. So just to give you a couple of examples of what this is really like, um, I'll start with the, uh, with the combined long tone exercise that I have in my packet. some of the points of restriction, over restriction maybe, or even what some of the points of too much manipulation may be. Probably heard me over manipulate the D just a little bit. <laughs> nice flexible descending slur down, the horn couldn't catch it, which is pretty nice. <laughs> you're working on not having too much pressure on the upper lip because of pain, this is another great way of doing it because you don't have to have an articulated attack with this. You can just have your air attack and then you're just working on the buzz up and down, very gentle. And then finally, another great thing when you're doing your lip slurs like this is you can figure out when the wind is not being directed in the right direction. As you heard on that descending, I kind of had a break up there on the, the F as I was coming down. And you can identify exactly what's going on. For me, the air was not getting slow enough for that mid register. So it was kind of the same speed for the upper stuff, never dropped it down. So that's a really, really great tool using it all throughout different ranges and figuring out what all the issues may be with your lip slurs. Uh, like I said, it's a great practice tool for any of your etudes. Um, just for example, let me just play a little bit of Conconi for you. And, and then I'll play it on the cutaway and show you what's really useful about this. Or I'll try. Well, all right. So I'm going to play something that's legato. Here we go. This is 21. So as we work through a legato line like that with the cutaway, we can actually figure out where there's issues with the air, where there's issues with the actual aperture. The other thing that we can do is we can actually identify 
some of the slide issues just by what's happening with the sound on the buzz. If I have inconsistent slide transfer, say that all of my incoming slide transfers to first position are too forceful, then I'm going to have a vibration disturbance in my, uh, whoops, my internet just got catchy. you. There it goes. Uh, then I can, I can actually figure out where that disturbance is coming from. Is it coming from the slide arm? Probably. So you can figure out different slide arm issues with that. You can also figure out if you've got different things going on. I was talking with somebody this week, I can't remember who it was, about kind of different head movements that were happening and towards the bell, away from the bell, various things like that. When you're doing that, if you're doing that when you're playing, when you put it on the, the cutaway mouthpiece, you're gonna hear a really big disturbance. So I'll just give you a couple of little uh, examples of what that may sound like. So I may do some head stuff, um, I'll do some jerky slide stuff. You may, may not be able to see it because of the camera, but you'll definitely hear it. Same excerpt from Kikoni. <laughs> just did something without even realizing I was doing it. As I was descending, I started to kind of puff my cheeks out. And that's something that happens sometimes when we do a descending slur. So you really hear that in the buzz because it suddenly becomes diffused. I'm going to do it again. Same story right there. Just kind of diffuses on me. So the tool is really useful for kind of hearing all those things and pointing all those things out. Um, the other thing that it can be useful for is actually practicing your scales and making sure that you actually have a good buzz on each scale. So if I take a scale that should be a fun one to play, uh, G minor. <laughs> G minor that I'm really buzzing all those pitches and I'm not just buzzing partials. Sometimes descending's harder. Uh-oh, not starting to buzz all the right pitches as you go down on a partial. So that's pretty tricky, um, but you can actually hear and then see that you're not actually making those partial changes. So it's also useful for scales like that. Um, finally, I like to actually use this for some of my articulation practice because I can really figure out what I'm maybe overdoing or underdoing. So um, you, could, you could practice like multiple articulations on it and make sure that you can really hear all of your multiple articulation patterns. Uh, you can also hear um, if, the, uh, if the aperture size of your embouchure is changing when you articulate. So if you put it on the cutaway, you can hear that there's a constant stream of air behind the articulation. If there wasn't, I'd end up with stuff like decay like this. So it's really evident if I don't have the air behind the buzz, even when I'm articulating. Um, if you're working on multiple articulation, it's making sure again that you have the air behind the butt, the articulation, but that you also are getting those uh, those softer consonants like your ka or your ga um, actually spit out. Um, it, 
if if it's not if you don't have a strong um, a strong soft consonant on your multiple articulation you'll end up with this <laughs> kind of sounds like um, it'll sound kind of mumbly so again it's it's partly a tool to kind of prove to yourself that you're actually doing what you think you're doing. Um, so I think, let me just look through my notes really quick. I think that was the big thing that I wanted to mention about the cutaway and practicing with that. Let's just take, I'll take a couple minutes real quick. Does anybody have any questions about using a cutaway or or, I mean, some of you might be a little confused because I haven't talked about cutaways yet with you and that there's probably reasons for that, but um, any general questions about cutaway mouthpieces? Yeah, Bill. I was curious on whether they're um, specific to the large bore or the small bore or whether it's tapered so you could use it in, in either type of horn. You can actually get them um, made for, for various bore sizes. So there's a small bore version and a large bore version. I hadn't thought of tapered. Tapered's genius. <laughs> I'll have to tell Mike that, the guy that makes them. But yeah, you, you can get them in, in both bore sizes. So if you wanted to use like your small bore horn, um, you could definitely get that. We can talk about that for sure. I'm just curious on that. That would uh, seem like a good idea, I guess. Just... Yeah. yeah, good question, good idea. <laughs> Anybody else have any other? Questions about what we just went over? Cool. Awesome. I love it. I must have done such a great job of, of explaining it, right? <laughs> so um, that that's kind of just a, uh, a brief overview on that stuff. If you, if you are interested or you have other questions about how to use it, uh, I think I've got a blog post on my blog that's that I maybe did in November or December. And then I'm also kind of coming out with a new um, video that get, goes over a few of these ideas in a little bit more detail on how I actually work through that. If you're ever teaching, um, if any of you are, are gathering up some students of your own, this is also a great tool for teaching because uh, what you'll notice is when we work with this sort of thing is that I can immediately have you buzz on a cutaway and you'll notice, um, I'll notice immediately what's really going on. So it's, it's a nice kind of um, tool diagnostic tool for really understanding what a student's doing and being able to actually dive in on detailed work on all those things. So just a brief overview on, on the cutaway system and, and how that works. Um, I think, you know, most of you, um, well, some of you have purchased these already and those of you who haven't, I've maybe talked to you about, but if you're interested in getting one, uh, talk to me first. Uh, I've, I've kind of got the, the inside hookup with the guy that's making them. And uh, I can get a pretty decent discount, especially when I order quite a few at a time. So I'm happy to help out with that. Otherwise, if you're really um, interested in getting one quickly, um, I think Hickey's has them and a couple other online retailers have them now. Um, so just look up MKS uh, Cutaway. Yeah, Bill. Well, you know, you know how um, regular mouthpieces have different sizes, I guess, like maybe diameter and the, the depth of the, uh, is it as critical on the, uh, cut away to, to use something that's the same size as the mouthpiece you're playing, or is it just the fact that it's open, uh, you know, is what is used to disclose where you have the issues and stuff? Right. Yes, yeah, that's, that's a good question, too. So the um, I believe he's got four different sizes for trombones. So the, there's one size for small bore, which is pretty close to like a, um, a six and a half AL size, pretty pretty standard rim. You know, it's it's important, but it isn't. What you really want is the same rim size or something close. Okay. Um, so it's a pretty similar rim for the small bore. I think on the the large bore version, he's got um, like a 5G rim size um, and then a little bit bigger than that, like a three and a half rim size and then a bass trombone that's closer to a 1G um, or like a Lasky 59 or something like that. So there, there are a few options that you can get, try to get as close as possible to what you usually have. The, it's on the cutaway, it's really the rim that's key since you're essentially eliminating the uh, depth of the cup and all that stuff. Yeah. So, so you probably have, probably have to make sure you're working with the right size mouthpiece in the first place to be able to figure out what cutaway you need then as well. Yeah. And it's part of the quest for the best mouthpiece. 
<laughs> the the everlasting quest. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah, good question. Thanks. Cool. Um, all right. Let me just check to be sure I got everything here. Yep, yep, yep. We're good. Okay. So um, as I kind of briefly mentioned at the very beginning, I also just wanted to go over a couple of things about COVID-19. So um, this, is, this is hopefully going to apply to all of us because hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be meeting in person um, after July lessons. I, that's really my big goal here is to actually see everyone and get to hear you in real life. <laughs> um, but a few things just to be thinking about, and these are some things that have come up in our discussions at the university, but also these are things, um, I've got quite a few articles now that have been published by peer reviewed uh, uh, medical journals like JAMA, uh, New England uh, uh, Journal of, of Medicine as well. So um, these are some things that I've been talking to some people that I know about, uh, that I know that are actually in the medical field. Um, and just kind of making sure that we're doing what we should be doing as trombonists and as brass players. So uh, again, it's, it's a little, there's still just like research is really lagging behind. So we don't know everything. And I'm not out to say that I think these are going to be the standards for the rest of this period and all that stuff. But these are just to say that these are kind of the recommendations that have been going out. If we are playing in chamber groups or in groups, or we're, we're going to lessons, there's a few kind of standard operational procedures that we should just kind of add into our uh, basic rep. Uh, the first thing is if you're going back to school and you share an instrument with anyone, you should try to do everything you can to not sh share an instrument. And if you are sharing an instrument, you should definitely wash your hands before and after you use that instrument. You should be using your own mouthpiece. Um, and then you should be using uh, at least a 70% alcohol solution to wipe down all the touch points on the instrument. Now we run into a little bit of an issue with cleaning our instruments because our instruments, most of our instruments are lacquered. And that's a protective layer for the brass so that the brass doesn't oxidize. And if you look at any of my horns, there's all these, all these oxidized places on all the touch points because eventually the lacquer does wear off. This alcohol, the 70% minimum 70% solution of alcohol, rubbing alcohol, will wear that lacquer away quicker um, than just our skin. So um, that's just something to be aware of. And it, it may just be kind of the uh, result of what we're dealing with, but it, it's um, definitely going to wear that stuff away a little bit quicker. So that's something to be aware of if you're sharing an instrument. At the university, for those of you who are coming up to the university, we do have a couple of bass trombones that we rent out. We're just going to try to do one person to a rental instrument this this year and see if we can get away with it. It may mean that not everybody's playing the newest instruments, but that's that's what we'll deal with there. Um, so there's some issues and some non-issues with playing. The big issue for us is kind of the opposite of what everybody's been talking about with wind instruments. When we exhale and we play the trombone, the velocity of the air is totally cut down by the buzz. So even if I just practice breathing, that's going to spread aerosolized droplets of viruses around a lot quicker than buzzing like that. Now, it seems counterintuitive because buzzing, sometimes when we're really buzzing with a lot of air, we end up with little bits of spit and stuff that go flying. Um, but those little bits aren't going as far as they would be if, as if we were just blowing air. So like a flute player, that's a that's gonna be a problem. Um, uh, singing is gonna be a problem because there's a lot of velocity of, of aerosolized uh, contaminants, but the buzzing is not so much the problem. The mouthpiece catches a lot of that too. So this is good news for us, but the bad news is we're breathing in a lot of air um, and that suction just br brings in that many, that's many more pot uh, potential contaminants. So that's something just to be aware of when you're thinking about your social distancing, um, making sure that you're at least six feet away from others because that gives you space for these aerosolized contaminants to actually drop out of the air, hopefully. Um, one other non-issue that was kind of brought up at first was your, uh, your actual condensation or when you're emptying your spit valve. Um, the studies, there's two studies now that have been completed about what's actually in condensation when it's empty. 
and it it turns out that there really isn't much in there um, that's actually from us. So the point being that any sort of um, either contaminants from saliva, which hopefully should not be going down into the bottom of your slide unless you're hockey loogies in there, um, but any sort of contaminants really should not be making their way into that. So when you empty your, your spit, when you empty your condensation, there really shouldn't be a, a big amount of problem with that. Um, I will be using a couple of actual spit collection cans. I've got some old coffee cans and stuff in the office, so I'll be better about using those. I'm not great about that, but I've been trying to be better about that. Um, just to kind of keep that contaminated so I'm not tracking it around most more than anything. Um, but it, it should not be a big deal. It shouldn't be a whole lot in there. Um, the real big problem for us is the mouthpiece. Um, and making sure that, that that mouthpiece is actually clean when we use it. So the recommendation um, from this study from, um, uh, from the Vienna Phil was that um, brass players actually spritz their mouthpiece with rubbing alcohol, again, a minimum of 70% uh, alcohol solution, um, and let it sit for at least 30 seconds um, to kill anything that's on there. Then kind of the key for us, the follow-up to that is then take a clean towel or a paper towel or something and wipe all that off because you don't want to be putting rubbing alcohol up on your chops. It's just going to chap your lips and dry things out. So if you don't have any of that stuff, you may want to think about getting some of it. Um, I, I think the last time I was in the store, it did look like they finally had some rubbing alcohol around. <laughs> it seems like it was kind of out for a while, but you don't have to get anything fancy, just a 70% solution and get a little spray bottle, kind of like a slide spray bottle. Um, if you use a slide spray bottle, make sure you mark it. You don't want to put alcohol on your slide probably, but um, that that should be pretty good for the mouthpieces. And I would recommend maybe doing that before you play and then after you play. Um, if you don't have a place in your case to keep a mouthpiece, you may want to get like a mouthpiece pouch to kind of keep that sort of thing too. Um, again, this is ways of kind of keeping things clean and from, from transferring um, the viruses more than anything. Um, to go along with that, the cleaning of the trombone or the cleaning of the, the mouthpiece, one of these studies recommended that um, or stated that a, a major touch point for us is actually like lockers. So a combination lock and a locker. Um, or the cases, the handle of a case or any touch points that you may have on a case. So that might just be something to kind of add to your list of things to clean once in a while. When we go back to school, um, maybe don't let anybody else touch your case just as a precaution. If you share a locker, definitely wash your hands before so that you're not spreading things from yourself to others and then wash your hands after so you're not getting things from other people. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but these are things that I have not thought of very carefully about before. Um, so for me, it's just kind of been fascinating to, to have these, these thoughts going around and, and actually thinking about some of them. Um, I'm just looking at my notes really quick, but you know, it's just a general idea of keeping things as clean as possible. Um, I, I guess one thing that I did kind of leave out is that you can get, um, like a, a commercial version of a mouthpiece cleaner. It's, uh, there's a couple different brands. One's called Mighty Mist. Um, I've seen these out there. Sometimes band directors have this for when you're sharing mouthpieces, that sort of stuff. Um, that's just a, it's a mint flavored uh, alcohol solution and it should work. But again, you have to let it sit for 30 seconds. You might want to check to see what percentage of alcohol is actually in there and how long you have to let it sit. Um, I noticed at Walgreens the other day, they actually have like mint flavored alcohol, which seems a little dangerous, but um, you could definitely, you know, use something like that too, if you don't like the, the smell of the alcohol on the, on the mouthpiece. Um, so again, these are just a couple of things that we've been thinking about. When we do get back together for lessons, there's um, kind of like four big changes in the operational procedure for the for the studio the actual office um the one thing about lessons is we will always just go down the hall and wash our hands together and uh that'll be kind of our chance to catch up and that's just kind of one of the recommendations that ul's got out there um and then there will be in the office kind of like this taped off line 
in the, in the actual studio. And one side's kind of supposed to be for me and the other side's supposed to be for you. The way I teach and the way we interact in a lesson, it's not necessarily going to be super easy for that to, to stay hard and fast rule, but that's, that's one thing that they've asked us to do and, and recommend it. So just so you know, that's kind of what's coming along here. Uh, on top of that, there's kind of two plexiglass <laughs> things that are going on. Um, supposedly they're going to mount some sort of plexiglass to have in the studio that's supposed to be between the teacher and the, and the student. I don't really know what this is going to look like or how we're really going to be able to use it. Probably more than anything, it's just a reminder. <laughs> um, but that's, that's just one of those things that you may notice is actually in the office when we get to go back to campus. And then the last thing is that they've recommended that when we're teaching that if we're not playing, we use a face mask. Um, and we, even if we are teaching that we use a face shield. Now, I don't, I don't have a face shield yet. I don't really understand. I don't know how this is going to work with the trombone and the mouthpiece. So this may be an, end up being a non-issue, but, but just so you all know, this is kind of stuff to be thinking of. I, I kind of have this visual in my head that we're all going to go back to school and it's going to be a little bit like walking into the Death Star or something and being like, why are all these people in white rubber uniforms? <laughs> um, so it's just going to be a little different. Um, and, and these are all just kind of the FYIs and the heads up on, on what kind of our procedure is going to be, a little, how our procedure is going to be different. So that's fun. That's a super fun studio class topic, isn't it? Um, so uh, if you, you have any questions when we start going back, just let me know. Um, right now, I'm assuming that um, classes right now are, we, of course, things may change, but right now classes are scheduled to start the third week of August. And I'll be planning on starting private studio lessons for those of you who will be doing that um, back up in September. So that's, that's our aims and goals. And hopefully by then we'll know exactly what we're doing and what we're dealing with. That's all I needed to go over today. So that was a lot. Um, next time we meet is actually going to be in two weeks. And I think I'll have probably try to have Jude play that week if it works for him. Bill's volunteered to play that week as well. So that'll work out really well. And then uh, would anybody else like to volunteer to play in two weeks? I'll leave it open to hand waves. Oh, yes. All right. Gotcha. So I'm going to put you on and then that's probably going to be a good amount. So we'll do that for, for two weeks. And then we've got our last, uh, last kind of normal studio class a week after that. And I'll be lining up some people to play for that. And I'm trying to get a guest artist in on that one as well. We'll see if that happens. And then we've got our recital the last week. Any questions for me? Awesome. Love it. Okay. Well, it's, it's great to see everybody. Um, I know that we were joined by a couple people on the live stream because they were traveling today, um, but we will uh, we'll get everybody back together in two weeks here. So enjoy your week off. And if I haven't seen you for a lesson yet this week, I'll see you tomorrow and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks. See you soon.